Thank you for this opportunity to present the keynote talk in the geophysical methods section of this workshop. I love seismic imaging and structural geology. And in these types of areas, uh, seismic imaging is lost without an understanding of structural geology. And we really need the seismic image to understand the subsurface structures. So I'm going to talk about seismic imaging and fold and thrust belts. I've got a bit extra time uh, with the keynote talk, so I'm going to give a bit of theoretical background as to what the, the define the imaging problem. Basically, difficult imaging areas require collaboration and geoscience integration to get an optimized image of the subsurface. So, the seismic imaging problem. When we record seismic reflection data, we don't know where that reflection, reflector energy originated. We need to know the velocity structure of the subsurface to image the seismic data, but if we already know the subsurface structure, then we don't need seismic data. And that's the, the problem we have to face generally with, uh, with the seismic experiment. Uh, however, in our specific area of a fold and thrust belt, high subsurface complexity and low seismic signal quality break those traditional methods, those traditional data-driven geophysical methods, and we need to have a more geologically constrained approach uh, to, uh, to understanding the subsurface and optimizing the image. So I have a couple of movies here showing waves propagating into the subsurface as a, a, in the hang wall of, a, of an overthrust, a modeled after the, the, uh, the Colombian Andes, and uh, you can see that we've got reflection energy coming up from the subsurface, uh, this is the wavefront uh, that is imaged, now the target reflector in the subthrust. Let's look at another one closer to the fault plane, and you can see the refraction across uh, at this interface and the bending of the wavefront. And then as, as that uh, propagates into the subsurface, we get a reflection off the, the target reflector, and then we can see this wavefront as it propagates back up to the surface. And it's going to arrive at an earlier time uh, and on and the energy that has passed through the overthrust is going to arrive at the surface at earlier time than the energy that has passed through the foreland side of the structure. So just to highlight this wave front as it's uh, reflected off of the subsurface reflector, uh, there's definitely quite a bit of a skew to this wave front that has resulted in this velocity variation. So we're trying to resolve some of these issues with seismic imaging. Now the algorithms that we use fall into these categories. PSTM, we're talking about Kirchhoff, pre stack time migration. It approximates near surface complexity with averaged velocities called RMS velocities. These may not make geologic sense because these RMS velocities are averaging through the near surface effects of heterogeneity and anisotropy. And I'll, I'll show you examples of that. It's a robust method that takes very little a priori knowledge of the subsurface. PSDM is, uh, refers to Kirchhoff pre-stack depth migration. It corrects for refraction and anisotropy effects in the layers above the target. So it corrects for these. It doesn't average through them. It corrects for the wave propagation effects. It uses interval velocity model that should correlate with the geology. In fact, the more uh, accurate uh, imaging will more accurately cor correlate with the geology. So that's, um, and if we have a geologically inaccurate velocity model, then we are not going to get a very good image. In fact, as my last sub bullet here, more delicate, it's more delicate than pre stack time migration. So an inaccurate velocity model results in weak imaging. Uh, thirdly, we have uh, reverse time migration, which doesn't, uh, so in, in our experience for projects we work at, uh, at Thrust Belt Imaging, um, all of the data goes through pre stack time migration. Half of those projects go to, to PSDM, and then another maybe 10% of those uh, go to reverse time migration. It's, it's a rare condition that requires this technology and, and it's also a rare condition where it actually works for us. Now, reverse time migration, despite the name, it is a depth migration, very similar to PSDM, uh, but it, it uh, has the added benefit of correcting for more dramatic velocity variation. It's even more sensitive to velocity errors than PSDM is why we don't apply it very often. We basically need a, a dramatic velocity inversion, like below an overthrust, which just happens fairly often. 
We also need a very high signal to noise, which is less often. We also need to really understand, have a very good understanding of our velocity model. We have a very accurate velocity model for our reverse time migration to work. So to hit those three criteria is, uh, is, is definitely rare in our, in our overthrust cases. Okay, these uh, the RMS velocities for pre-stack time migration, we average through various near surface effects along an illumination direction. It's the redundancy of the seismic experiment that helps us constrain these velocities. So when, when we shoot surface seismic data, uh, we uh, were trying to image an imaging point in the subsurface down here. And uh, the, on the blue ray path, we would have a source and receiver that would image a very near offset. And, uh, and then the green ray path represents a slightly longer distance between source and receiver, the, the offset between source and receiver. And then as we get out to the red, which is our maximum, the warmer colors here, then we've got very long offset. Now, those ray path lengths get longer, so then any velocity errors are going to be uh, much greater on the long offsets than the near offsets. So we rely on this redundancy in the seismic experiment um, to help constrain the velocities. So here's an offset image gathered. Offset is increasing from left to right. So we've got these longer offsets on the right. And you can see we've got this upward curvature on the gather, which indicates the velocity is, um, is too low. So then we have to increase our velocity uh, to flatten that image gather out. And then we go, okay, well that's a much more flat image gather throughout. And then if we uh, increase our velocity further, then we'll have velocity that's too high. And then we are going to, uh, to overcorrect and we'll have a, have a significant uh, uh, curvature again. So looking at this, it seems like, okay, well, it's pretty easy to tell when that image gather is flat and when you have a, a accurate velocity model. But this is not the common case in, a, in an overthrust setting because of our geologic complexity, near surface conditions, etc. We tend to have very noisy pre-stack data. So if we look at these ones, low velocity and then accurate velocity and then high velocity, you know, we could probably pick something in the middle or we say this is fairly flat, but we really can't get the full um, picture of the velocity structure of the subsurface from just a few ref few reflectors on the pre-stack data. So we rely on the structural geology and we rely on analyzing different model scenarios uh, to see how the, um, how the different velocity models are going to uh, affect the seismic image. So let's stick with pre-stack time migration for now, the PSTM velocities. And PSTM uses RMS, or average velocity, down to each imaging point. It initially was developed really as a, as a simplification, approximation, save computer runtime back when computers were expensive. Uh, it, it turns out the robustness of it is very convenient to use, especially when we don't ha really understand the subsurface velocity structure. So we don't have a lot of constraints on the velocity model. pre time migration is a robust method for that. So the PSTM velocity is a processing parameter that may or may not correlate with geological or petrophysical parameters. And generally it doesn't because we're just averaging through all the various effects. It's also dependent on the reflector dip because it averages along the illumination direction. And I'll show you what that, what that means with this cross-sectional example. So let's imagine we've got this brown uh, exploration target in the subsurface. We've got low velocity rocks on the right high velocity rocks or a thrust, an overthrust to surface on the left. And, uh, and let's imagine that we've got this back thrust uh, above the target that we want to image as a, as a constraint on our interpretation. Okay, so if we've got a nice reflector off of that, it's going to be illuminated with rays that are, are pointing uh, to the right. So source and receiver is off to the right, are going to, the energy is going to go down and, and image this back thrust and back up to the surface and be recorded at the surface over here. So the velocity to image this back thrust is going to be low. And uh, the, if we want to image the back limb of the target reflector, these rays are going to pass through this high velocity overthrust structure. So there'll be a reduction in travel time along this ray and, and the average velocity down to this imaging point is going to be much higher because it's these, the illumination direction is going to see this higher velocity material. 
So then you can imagine if we try to uh, average through, we've got low average velocity to here and then high average velocity to there. Um, if, we, if we just uh, make some simplifying assumptions here and, and just, we only think simply about the, the, vertical, uh, the vertical velocity from surface to, to here, to the blue zone, and from the surface down to the red zone, uh, we would need a really significantly uh, increased interval velocity over this interval to go from a low average to here to a much higher average down to here. So we end up with this extreme interval velocity when we, uh, when we try to convert uh, these uh, pre-stack time migration velocities, the RMS velocities to, uh, to interval. And here's another example, a uh, seismic example, and this is, shows uh, issues with RMS velocity uh, caused by anisotropy. So anisotropy is when we have a higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding and a lower velocity in the direction perpendicular to bedding. I'll talk a bit more about that later. But let's, let's look at this simple structure. We've got this monocline, or sorry, anticline-syncline pair in the broad sense. And uh, in the, where the anticline is imaged, uh, you can see uh, the velocity is a bit lower than the rocks around it. The warmer colors are higher velocity, cooler colors are lower velocity. So relatively speaking, this uh, yellow area has uh, lower velocity than the rocks around it. But these are just average velocities from the surface. The actual rocks are likely have the same velocity as the rocks around them, but we're imaging from the surface down um, and uh, and the anisotropy is going to give us this variation in velocity. Over in the syncline side, we see the opposite. We see a significant increase in velocity as we, um, as we try to find the optimum imaging velocity for the syncline. And the reason for this is this anisotropy effect. So we've got this higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding and a lower velocity in the direction perpendicular to bedding. And of course that bedding uh, orientation is changing significantly across the, across the line. And, um, and then if we try to image in the, in the, within the anticline, then, uh, then these ray paths that, that go from the source down uh, to the reflection point back up to the receiver, they're going to run at, at angles fairly close to normal to bedding. In fact, throughout, they're going to, they're gonna, the uh, imaging direction is normal to bedding. So the, uh, the RMS or average velocity down to this imaging point is gonna be lower than the rocks around it because they're going to image at different angles. And in the syncline, that's where we can see that the most dramatic change, the average velocity down to this point in the subsurface uh, is going to be higher because the imaging angle is at, at an angle oblique to bedding, almost parallel to bedding on this side, and about 45 degrees to bedding on this side. So it's going to see a higher velocity at that averages down to here to optimize the imaging. And then if we take this uh, RMS velocity field and we try to calculate intervals, then we get all these uh, dramatic uh, variation going on. Um, and, uh, and this is non geologic I mean, it's the same rock layer here and down in here and up here. So we would expect this to have the same interval velocity. But because we've calculated this from uh, an, R an average velocity, um, then it, it's not necessarily going to make geologic sense, even in that simple structure. Okay, now how do we get this, uh, this velocity? I said, hey, this is where we find this optimized uh, imaging velocity. Well, how do we get there? Well, this is a, a tool we call VEL, VEL anal for VEL velocity analysis. And we've got this velocity picking window over here on the left. And I'll just kind of kick this movie off here. And we're going to animate between velocities that are too high, too low, too high, too low. And, uh, and as we go back and forth, we can find where we've optimized the imaging. So now I can make picks in, in the velocities of the shallow section. That's where I think the imaging is optimized. The right half of the screen shows a composite image of those pick velocity panels. So you can see the imaging in real time gets updated with each pick as, we, as, we, as I attempt to optimize the imaging of this 2D seismic line. Now I'm going to make the picks on this, on this horse structure here and uh, an optimized imaging of that. And then as we carry down into the subsurface, we'll try to make, uh, we'll pick these deeper events. Now over on the right, uh, this structure over here, it gets larger and smaller with the velocities. And this is the kind of thing uh, geophysical jokes are made out of. 
uh, the, the, the geophysicist gives you the structure, the size that you want. Um, but it, really, we want to, uh, to be as constrained as possible, and we want to see the uncertainty of it. And that's why it's very important for, for seismic interpreters to see these velocity movies and engage with us uh, for two reasons. One is if we understand the, the geologic structures that we, anticipate, that we want to see, then, then we can optimize the imaging better. Also, and perhaps most importantly, the, uh, the interpreter and structural geologist can see the structural uncertainty. Uh, if we have a few velocity panels different, maybe the structure would be bigger, smaller, more fault constrained, uh, or more fold oriented. Okay, so just the high points regarding these RMS velocities. The RMS velocity is a processing parameter that averages through effects of seismic heterogeneity and anisotropy. It's unfortunate we call it velocity because it's, it's not really a rock physics parameter. It's really a processing parameter. Lateral and vertical variation in RMS velocity is dependent on the illumination angle and, uh, and the reflector dip. So oftentimes it doesn't make geologic sense. Variation the averaging along the illumination direction means velocity will not typically make this geologic sense. So we won't. Uh, however, we can use geologic constraints in picking RMS velocities because we, we, the geometry of reflector shapes uh, as we pick them on the velocity panels should make geologic sense. So, and oftentimes if um, we will make, we'll pick two different scenarios, uh, slightly higher RMS velocities or lower to see which uh, makes more sense in terms of the shape of the geometry of the subsurface structure. But it is definitely a bit under constrained. And that's where depth migration comes into play. So I'll talk about the contrast between seismic imaging in time and depth. Um, they're really complementary technologies. Time imaging is for robustness and uh, depth imaging is for the accuracy. Here's an example of a data set from Canada where we've got in the presec time migration we've got this robust imaging all across the data set. The straight ray assumptions and the uh, RMS velocities uh, averaging through the various effects in the near surface and we can pick an optimized imaging for all of these structures. This uh, anticlinal structure in the blue and this duplex system circled in the green. And uh, if we look at uh, isotropic depth migration, so only correcting for the ray bending across this fault, then uh, we can improve the imaging of this duplex system. So let's go before and after, before and after, and we've got a really nice uh, imaging of this duplex system. However, We've got this laterally varying dip in the near surface, so a lot of variation in the orientation of the high velocity and low velocity directions in the, uh, in the anisotropy of the near surface, and that makes this break down. We don't have the luxury of being able to average through these effects with, uh, with depth migration. And that was part of the problem with depth migration in the early days. Before we corrected for anisotropy, it was an uh, exercise in frustration. Once we started correcting for anisotropy, then we could uh, heal up um, well, the base of the syncline here becomes healed when we correct for the anisotropy. Also, the structure in blue is healed uh, when we correct for the ray bending. And, um, and also, uh, there's a significant improvement in imaging of the uh, sharpening up the edges and uh, bring out the coherency of this duplex system when we, uh, when we correct for the anisotropy. Now notice there's a lateral position shift between time and depth, there, sorry, between isotropic and anisotropic depth migration. It, um, uh, there, all of these are displayed in time, just so that we, can, uh, we don't see the, the vertical shift, only the horizontal shift. And, uh, and you can see there's definitely a significant horizontal shift. And that is caused by this dipping anisotropy effect, which I'll show you illustrate here. If we've got a higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding, lower velocity in the direction perpendicular to bedding, the wave front in the subsurface is going to be skewed toward the high velocity direction. So the point of deepest penetration of the wave front is not going to bleed directly below the source location, but it's going to be shifted laterally over, over here. And this is a side slip effect. As the wave propagates down the subsurface, it just kind of shifts to one side or slips to the side, hence the side slip effect. So I've got a movie that shows animation of a, of a wave propagation 
uh, in this uh, homogeneous overburden, horizontal reflector, higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding, lower velocity in the direction perpendicular to bedding. And as the energy propagates into the subsurface, it impinges on the interface at this point, and then it comes back up to surface uh, and follows the same ray path. Because the side slip effect goes toward the high velocity direction on the way down, and it also goes toward the high velocity direction on the way up, which is in the opposite direction. So we're going to look at the ray path now as it propagates in the subsurface, reflects, and comes back up to the surface. We record the reflection energy at the surface of this position. And if we ignore the anisotropy, we're going to put it over here. And as we saw in the previous seismic data example, when we correct for the anisotropy, it shifts it to the left, or it shifts it toward the down dip direction. So that's another important thing that we want to uh, correct for in, in depth migration. So let's compare, before we talk about depth migration velocity model building, let's compare uh, time and depth imaging. With time, we nearly always get a clear basic image. With depth, it's predictive, uh, so that it needs this accurate model to image. The delicate nature of it is, uh, helps it to be predictive. So that velocity model is inaccurate, we don't get much of an image. With time, the velocity model is independent of the geology, and uh, in depth, the velocity model ties with the geology. So we have this degree of freedom with the time, and we've got this nice geologic constraint with the depth. We have a more coherent image, oftentimes with the time migration because of its robustness, and we get more accurate position of the reflectors in depth because we're correcting for refraction and anisotropy effects, the side slip. With time, it allows us this constant velocity movie analysis to find the reflectors hidden in the noise. Very powerful tool, the, the movie method that we showed, I showed you earlier. In depth, uh, it corrects for complex ray paths and, and it can image steep dips or fault edges that the time migration just can't image. Okay, let's talk a bit about model building. So this is where the geologic uh, constraints are, are extremely important. Basically what we do is we interpret uh, inter the interfaces and uh, to draw the velocity um, boundaries and, uh, and we display rays to show where we illuminate the subsurface and, and what uh, changes in the subsurface velocity structure are going to affect the imaging at the imaging point. And then we have an image gather display to indicate the potential velocity changes. So this, uh, the smiling and frowning of the image gathers I showed you earlier. Now notice here, we've got a, a many reflectors on the stack section. It's a really beautiful uh, seismic data set, uh, relatively speaking for a thrust belt data set. And yet we only really have uh, two or maybe three uh, events on the pre-stack gathers to help constrain all of these layers in the velocity model. So we want to build, we need to build this geological model. So we build a geological model uh, and we're, this is where the interpreter collaboration is key. We base it on the structural geology and we correct for anisotropy always right from the beginning why, why would we ignore such a significant effect. So we, we build a dip model and we correct for the TTI anisotropy. Then we use those velocities uh, corresponding to individual rock units. Considering the model trail, the, sorry, the model scale that affects travel times. The thickness, uh, th so thickness is more than like multiple seismic wavelengths long, so 200 meters or bigger. Uh, to, to really you know, capture the wave propagation effects. And uh, the sensitivity of imaging to the model velocity decreases with depth. So it's more important for us to have an accurate representation of the near surface velocities than, than the subsurface velocities. And then we test those model scenarios based on seismic diagnostics and an interpreter and geologic input. So how the workflow uh, works is, is like this really simplistically we have the interpretation and the process gathers from the time processing are our inputs we get our velocity model and then we can migrate those data and then once we have a depth migration we ask ourselves the tough questions now if we optimize the image how does the depth migration compare to the time migration and do the wells tie is, is the size of reflector depth uh, the same as what we observe at the well depth and typically the answer to these questions are no, 
uh, if we knew the subsurface velocity structure perfectly, we would not need duck migration in the first place. Um, so we have to revise our interpretation based on well missed ties, based on any diagnostics we use from the seismic data, based on what we see comparing the time and depth images. We come up with a different interpretation, different model scenario, build a new velocity model, migrate again. And then we go around the circle six, eight, maybe ten times until we've optimized the velocity model. And then we just do some simple uh, coherency enhancement, kind of some makeup, if you will, to tidy up the image and, um, and then create the final segue volume. That's the bit of residual move out on the gathers and the coherency filter. So here's a data example from northern uh, Colombia. This is a flower structure on the Rio Sulia field we published a number of years ago uh, with Echo Patrol. And um, this is the interpretive model building display. And it's, we're just trying to get as much information as we can. This is a tool, uh, software called Open Detect, which is actually uh, free to download. And, uh, and their business model is we can purchase uh, plugins for it, which we have. Um, the, um, uh, what we've got here, we've got the seismic data from the 3D volume. Overlaid is the color of the uh, velocity structure that we interpreted uh, based on uh, our understanding of the, of the structure and the wells in the area, the several wells across this 3D. And you can see we've got a lot of reflectors on the 3D volume that are, look beautiful, but the pre-stack data only shows uh, four or five uh, at the key boundaries. It is nice to use this as a constraint. These are pretty good looking image gathers, relatively speaking, uh, but it, it, we, it's not enough information to get this detailed velocity structure that we need to optimize the imaging. And we've got a well uh, that we're using for well ties to these different reflectors that also helps constrain our velocity model. So here's the, the, the sonic uh, from, from one of the wells across this block. And, uh, and they, the sonic trends do offer uh, some degree of freedom. As you, you can see we've got some level of uncertainty. If we just want to block off these layers, we can follow the, follow the trends however we like. And uh, this is the, the velocity trend that optimized the seismic imaging. Um, follow the trends this way, a little bit, a little bit um, uh, lower velocity over the upper, um, over the upper layer, a little, uh, and, um, and, uh, and a little bit higher velocity over the next layer and then kind of follow down the middle of the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, um, of the intervals here. But we've got these gradients in our velocity model and these velocity contrasts at the boundaries. Uh, so we were able to find a velocity model that um, you know, followed the general trends of the sonic and uh, most importantly, was able to tie the well depths. That's sort of the key calibration point is it the velocity model that gets the, the relationship between the time, uh, the seismic time, and of course the well depth um, is, uh, is really a key, um, a key calibration point and a key constraint uh, to the uh, velocity model. Now finally, just to wrap this up with uh, uh, a really interesting case history uh, from a 2D data set in the, in the Colombian Andes and, uh, and, the, and the end of the Janos uh, Basin, in the foothills there, the Piedmonte, um, we've got uh, we've got high signal to noise on this 2D line. Uh, we've got fairly good RTM results in the strong signal areas, and the Kirchhoff pre-stack depth migration is more robust in the area of higher model uncertainty. So let's uh, let's look at these technologies. So again, this is a classic uh, classic example of. Um, uh, cross-section uh, for exploration has all kinds of detail down at the reservoir level um, which which we will kind of average through we don't really need this level of detail down down deep uh, we need more more detail in the shallow section so we basically follow these uh, basic geologic trends just we combine uh, these intervals in the deep section together and focus more on the, the details in the shallow so here's our uh, pre-sec depth migration velocity model that we converged to uh, using several iterations and a lot of feedback back and forth between the, the structural geologists and the seismic interpreter with Echo Patrol. Um, and here's the resulting uh, uh, PSDM image, which is, is just beautiful. This is really good quality data. Um, and now I'm just gonna uh, compare this, uh, we're gonna zoom in on this um, area on the right so we can compare back to time. 
Here's the legacy pre-stack time migration uh, before we did the uh, reprocessing in time. And, uh, and we've got uh, the general uh, trends or image. It's really quite, uh, again, really excellent seismic data. Um, you can see uh, maybe our, our results uh, reprocessed in time is a bit overcooked, shall we say, in the shallow section, a bit more coherent than it has to be. Uh, but we're trying to optimize the imaging in the subthrust and these deeper structures down in here. And so we're able to get a lot more detail uh, with, um, uh, with the coherency enhancement and the improved pre-stack time migration velocity analysis. And then if we compare this to the pre-stack death migration, I just, I just, just scaled the death migration back to time. So PSDM in time uh, for comparison purposes, you can see we've got a lot more detail in the football uh, because of this velocity contrast that we looked at the very beginning of my talk with the overthrust structure, uh, the death migration is able to correct for these refraction effects and get a much better uh, perspective on this. Also, in the core of the syncline, the synclines are really difficult for time migration to image, so we just weren't able to get the velocities to work through the syncline here, and we're able to resolve that significantly in through there. And this is a good constraint on the accuracy of our velocity model, because this is the near surface, the lens through which we see the subsurface, so we want to have that imaged, uh, image, imaging in the shallow optimized for death migration. And here's the RTM. Now, I think I the thing I like about the RTM is it's easier to follow uh, the events through the footwall syncline, and we get it, or it can make a correlation and follow through the from the foreland up into the uh, into the footwall structure. Um, whereas in the, it's difficult to follow some of these reflectors in through here, so it's an incremental improvement, and uh, and I think fairly uh, a fairly solid uh, improvement in there. Also, down in the deep section over here, uh, we've got, uh, we've got these, uh, this structure uh, in the broad anticline, uh, and we're able to get the side limbs of the anticline to image much better uh, with the RTM as it passes through this complex uh, structure in the, in the anticline-syncline pair. Now go back to the time, uh, our time migration, and then we're going to pan over and have a look at it on the left side of the section where things get a little more interesting. Now we're, we're coming up into the overthrust area, up into the mountains, and, uh, and, and we've got, uh, uh, in the west end here, we've got a lot more geologic complexity. And so here's the time versus the depth, so PSTM versus PSDM. And we're able to get these dips on the depth migration that we didn't have really very well in the time, and it correlates with the outcrop of the fault. So we've got steep dips in the surface geology and then flatter dips in through here, and that correlates on the depth migration versus the time. And I think we're getting more detailed imaging over on this side, but definitely a different perspective. Oftentimes, the depth and time uh, migration just give you a different perspective. And uh, you may have to decide what's, uh, what was more geologically accurate in terms of the imaging. Now here's where the, the RTM breaks down, and we really don't have uh, a very good RTM image. These dips are going opposite uh, to what the surface geology indicates, and uh, there's something wrong with the, the data signal quality is too low, and the structural complexity is too high, and the model uncertainty is too high, so RTM is broken down. And that's a very common uh, problem we have. We, we have to meet these three criteria to make, uh, make RTM work for us. Okay, just to summarize and a few concluding statements, um, the interpretation input and geologic constraints are important for optimizing the imaging velocity model. The collaboration with the structural geologists is essential uh, to imaging success. Beneath the complex velocity structure with strong signal, the deeper events improved in coherency and geometry with increasing improvements in imaging technology from uh, kind of on a spectrum from PSTM to PSDM to RTM. But the RTM broke down in the area of model uncertainty and low signal to noise. So one thing we just in the overall trend we observed is that we, you know, as we increase um, our you know, high fidelity methods, 
uh, we increase both accuracy and sensitivity. They become uh, more accurate, but also more delicate as we go from PSTM to PSDM to RTM. Thank you for your uh, attention.